Um, I'm Candace Audres. I'm a developmental psychologist. Um, I trained in developmental and quantitative psychology, and I've worked on adolescent mental health for 20 years, um, starting actually in the streets of, of Vancouver with young children who'd been sexually exploited. Um, since 2008, um, I've been following young people around on their digital devices, on their mobile phones, and we've been capturing in daily life their mental health, their sleep, the types of things they experience both offline and online, and how those interact to influence their mental health. And so I'm, I'm happy to be with you today because this is an issue that's top of mind for everyone. Um, I'm also a parent of tweens. So I have an 11 year old and a 14 year old. So I live this along with all of you every day. Um, and in the, this short time, I just wanted to leave you with kind of three things that I've learned along this pretty long uh, journey looking at this. Um, the first thing, and I think maybe the reason that many of us are here today is adults don't like this, right? So we do not like what social media looks like. We don't like what it feels like. We don't like watching our young people spend all this time on it. Now the charge, one of the charges is that this is just another moral panic, the same thing we did with romance novels or comic books or video games or television. Um, and you know that might be true. It, it feels like we're at a height of a moral panic for sure, but it, there's also been massive changes in some of the real types of risks that we just heard Keith review here. So the frame that we tend to take is of risks and benefits of ways that we can use this big tent perspective, bringing all of the stakeholders together to minimize those risks, right? And optimize opportunities and benefits because the online world is not going away anytime soon. And we need to design it together in ways that support our young people. Um, now, the second point I'm going to make is going to be kind of surprising, um, and this can often take people on off guard because it's not the typical point that people will make. And this is the point that um, the story that most of you have heard about social media's impacts on the brain and on mental health is not actually supported by the science. It's a story that's told very broadly and very compellingly. But if you look at the overall scientific evidence, and the National Academies of Sciences actually convened a panel and did this, spent a year reviewing the evidence, you know, taking testimony, and what they concluded is that there's these tiny associations between social media and mental health. Um, they're sometimes positive, they're sometimes negative. There's no real causal connection that's been established, right, in terms of the, the bulk of our evidence. And the biggest thing is this distance between what the science to date says about this connection and what people strongly believe. So that's been a really fascinating area for me to explain, um, to explore as we've followed young people around and over time. What we do find is young people that are struggling with mental health issues do spend a little more time online. They use um, social media in different ways. But what we find is that those young people that are struggling, it predicts forward. They go on to use social media in different ways versus vice versa. So we have to worry about which direction we're drawing this arrow in. And, and that's been an important thing to, to consider. Um, and the last thing that I, I want to touch on, you know, thinking about this kind of unsettled science, I think many of us are assuming that these impacts are negative. We've been told that smartphones have destroyed a generation. We've been told that social media is destroying our children's brains and driving an epidemic of mental illness even though the epidemiologists, even though the psychologists, even though the people that have reviewed this literature are not finding that story you know, to be true. And that's leading to some pretty aggressive solutions in this space. Um, some of them might work, most of them we don't know, um, but these are young people. These are people that deserve careful review of the evidence. They deserve evidence-based policymaking and so when we talk about shutting off smartphones or, or banning phones or um, putting some pretty harsh restrictions on those, I think we need to ask ourselves, you know, what are we shutting off? What are we taking away? And what are the, what are the costs of that? So when we talk about bans, for example, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions around that, um, and school districts and others go forward to put through bans, you know, saying that they're saving young children's mental health, we have to ask whether or not that's actually what's the, what the outcome is of, of those types of procedures and what types of access to information, to technology, to friendships, the types of things that Keith mentioned, the young people also spend their time doing online, are we shutting down? So I'm, I'm really excited that the Walsh has invited us all here to have this kind of big tent conversation. There are no 
easy solutions or simple stories in this space. So it's, it's great to convene in this way. And thank you.